currently setting up the Mobius Emerging Opportunities Fund. So I'm very pleased to welcome him on this special program edition of Market Masters. Mark, great to have you back on CNBC TV 18. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, Mark, so let's just get the uh, basic hygiene stuff out of the way. India still top of the list as far as the emerging market ranking for you goes? Yes, it is. Uh, uh, for many, many reasons, you know, I've been a big bull on India, uh, but we must take a long-term view. And if you look at the long-term, India looks terrific. Uh, uh, it's got the right population structure. Uh, now with uh, China slowing down, India is going to be taking up the slack in terms of manufacturing and exports. So India is in a very good position. There's no question about it. Uh, you know, you're setting up a, a new fund, Mark, and you're in, of course, touch with uh, lots of investors who'd want to put money into your fund and who know what you want to do. You want to put, sort of, you know, put money into India. That's the largest weight for you. I mean, at, at least, uh, you know, uh, where you want to go. Uh, from a foreign investor point of view, I mean, how do they, uh, what are some of the pushbacks that you get right now? We're in election season right now. Most opinion polls suggest uh, that Mr. Modi and the BJP will come back to uh, come back to power for a third term. Uh, so just wanted to sort of get your sense and feedback uh, in terms of what you're hearing from investors. Uh, yeah, there are questions regarding uh, Modi having so much power and increasing power. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, India is the largest democracy in the world. It's got an incredible uh, uh, election system that goes on, as you know, for months. And uh, I believe that uh, the position of most investors around the world are beginning to change. Uh, they've, of course, been burned very badly in China, and they're looking for another place in which to invest. And India seems to be the, the logical choice. Now, of course, for global investors, uh, they've been making good money in Japan. Uh, the U.S. market has done very well. But at the end of the day, uh, India is now beginning to outperform the U.S. market. And it makes sense for people to look at India. Now, of course, there's a problem of size. Uh, there needs to be more equity offerings in India more IPOs, and hopefully more uh, government enterprises being uh, uh, listed in the market. Because, uh, as you know, uh, India has some very large government enterprises that could be listed. So that's a, a challenge. But of course, that will come, I believe, as Modi gets more strength politically. And of course, you know, he is interesting in digitizing the Indian economy and is interested in technology generally. So we're in a very good position now with him getting stronger with a, a stronger political base. Mm. You know, Mark, I want to come to, uh, I'll, I'll get to asking you about what should we expect from the third term? What would you like to see uh, from the government in the third term? Because so much of the infrastructure development and spending on infrastructure sectors, make in India, import substitution has been driven by government policy, right? It's not just services, it's now manufacturing, which is uh, I mean, which is being built, uh, and that's great to see. Uh, but before I do that, uh, let me ask you this India-China question. I remember I speak, uh, speaking with Rajiv Jain of GQG Partners. They're the single largest foreign investor in India now. Uh, and and uh, he said, you know, the shift from, uh, for, uh, you know, people who invested in China and that money, you know, in a, in a big way coming to India, it will happen, but it has not happened yet. It will happen in the future. Do you agree with that, Mark? Uh, that that big shift is yet to happen. Yes, uh, and the reason why it hasn't happened as big as big as it should happen is because uh, the liquidity is not there. In other words, if you look at the size, the market capitalization of the Indian market compared to the Chinese market, it's completely different. China is much, much larger. So large investors from the US and other parts of the world find it difficult to put their money too much money into India. So that's the reason why I say there needs to be an expansion of the Indian equity market. Uh, that means more private companies being uh, IPO'd, but also government privatization. And you mentioned infrastructure. I think one area where you can have a lot more size is in the infrastructure area if you do IPOs of uh, various infrastructure projects, whether it be bridges, uh, toll roads, 
uh, whatever. Of course, the railroads in India is one area that has incredible potential for growth. Mark, hi, welcome to the show. Well, just uh, focusing a little bit on the near-term theme of elections combined with sectors or themes that you would probably like. Anything specific, you mentioned infrastructure, but would consumption, financials be themes that you would look, up, look at as a run-up to elections and maybe even post-elections? Well, post-election, I think uh, the, the uh, very interesting area would be hardware, technology hardware. Um, as you know, India is a huge exporter of software. They're doing very, very good in software. But uh, now there's a need to expand the hardware sector, technology hardware. And of course, as people want to diversify their supply chain away from China, India can take up that slack. You've got the population, you've got the capability, and I believe that's going to be a very interesting area for expansion and IPOs, by the way. Right. So, you know, you did speak about a lot of supply or the possibility of a lot of supply in the Indian markets, etc. as well, Mark. I want your thoughts on three things in particular. We usually ask you to make predictions about uh, markets, but if you could give us a sense of what your expectations from the elections are um, and what post the elections, Modi 3.0, what does that look like to you? And for the PSUs itself, you hoped that there would be some more offerings coming in. What would your thoughts be out here? Well, one of the things that we're seeing, of course, is Modi becoming stronger politically. In other words, uh, uh, it looks like he's going to have a, a larger, uh, a stronger position in the political structure of the Indian market. And that is very good news for investors because it means that he's going to continue to push for uh, technology in India and the application of technology. That's number one. Number two, he's going to be pushing more for infrastructure. And that's going to be, of course, we've seen a lot of infrastructure spending, but I think that's going to be becoming much more important and critical for the growth of India. So uh, all of the points are in line. We're in a very good position with Modi getting stronger politically. Mm. Uh, you know, you mentioned more supply, right, on the equity side. Uh, and that is perhaps uh, one thing which perhaps, we, perhaps we've not seen over the last 10 years. I'm talking about disinvestments. Do you think that will also be picked up, uh, you know, in uh, the third term? It could pick up? Uh, yes, uh, a lot, by the way, a lot depends on the uh, ability of Modi to reduce the amount of bureaucracy uh, for people who want to invest in India. As you know, there's quite a lot of bureaucracy for people wanting to put money into the Indian market. Uh, for the large investors, it's easier, but for the smaller investors, not so easy. So I think that's something that uh, Modi will want to work on, uh, reducing mm. the bureaucracy and the paperwork necessary to get into the Indian market. Are you buying public sector banks or public sector units in general? Because the PSU enterprise crossed that 50 lakh crore in market cap. We've seen a big relentless rally out there. Where are you on that? Are you buying at current levels? Did you buy earlier? Your thoughts going forward? Uh, normally, we don't go into the banks. Uh, and that's a, a policy globally, with very few exceptions. Uh, we find that uh, Banks are subject to a lot of government regulation. And of course, uh, they have problems uh, down the line if you no, have- Not just banks, uh, the public sector enterprise in general, all the public sector units. Yes, we're looking at the public sector very, very closely. We haven't invested yet, but we're looking at it very closely because we believe that's where you can get size- What themes there? To invest. Yes. What kind of themes there in the public sector space? There, uh, I'm very, very interested in infrastructure. I believe that uh, that would be a very uh, high growth area. Uh, rail, uh, the rail sector is very, very interesting. And the air airline sector is also interesting. Mm. Okay. Well, Mark, uh, you know, 
we need to take a short break but before we do that uh, just wanted your thoughts on the entire theme of the mid caps as well as the small caps we all know it's been phenomenal it's been re remarkable in terms of the returns that we've seen for the mid caps as well as the small caps but do you think that there should be maybe some amount of caution which could be probably seeping in do you expect those kind of returns to probably continue into this year or you're probably going to take some profits now uh, that's an interesting question. If you look at the U.S. market, you'll see that uh, the big 10 big tech sector companies are most popular. And uh, that's not the case in India yet. That could happen. But I believe that the small and mid cap companies are the ones to look at because they're often ignored and they're not fully researched. So people who are willing to put the work in and look at these companies can really make good money. And I think that's going to continue. Hmm. Well, in the recent past, you spoke about Wari, Tips and NetWeb. Wanted your thoughts on if there have been more additions to that list? Uh, that's that's a good good question, but I'm not... Um, we're now looking at them and I can't comment. <laughs> hmm. You're going to... Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, you know, that, that fund will uh, be set up and then uh, you'll sort of uh, come in. But those three still uh, uh, remain on the radar? Ma uh, Mark? Yes, definitely, yes. Okay, and of course, many more names, right? I mean, uh, in addition yeah. to that, in, to those three names. By, by the way, Mark, <laughs> by when are we going to see that fund? When are we going to see what? The, what? Uh, the fund, the, the new fund, which you're new setting fund. up? Uh, that will not come into play until September, October. Okay. We're now going All right. So, okay. Now, just to press on that point about valuations uh, a bit longer, right? Uh, we've had uh, we were talking about supply. We've had many uh, instances of global companies, MNCs, reducing their stakes in the India entity, uh, in the respective India entity, and uh, essentially using that money and taking that money back home for vari for a variety of purposes. You know, we had, for example, just to uh, use an anecdote, the Whirlpool Global CEO on the record uh, essentially saying that there is a big valuation arbitrage between what the India entity trades at and what the global uh, parent trades at. So it kind of makes sense to uh, use that and monetize that arbitrage. Uh, just your thoughts, uh, Mark. I mean, these are business owners uh, mm. and, and sort of talking about this valuation uh, difference. And of course, I mean, the implication being that valuations here are uh, you know, quite high, relatively speaking. Mark? Of course, you, you can look at that. All the multinationals almost that are in India, the valuations are higher than what you see in their home market. And there's a good reason for that, growth. Uh, you know, a lot of people ask me, gee, India looks expensive on a PE basis, but they forget that the E, the earnings, are growing at a much faster pace than what you see in the U.S. or China or anywhere else. So it's justified that these companies have a higher valuation. All right. You know, Mark, what we'll do is uh, we have a lot more ground to cover, but let's just take that quick commercial break here. Stay with us, Mark. We are back with uh, many more questions, both local and a bit about the global uh, cycle as well. Stay with us. Investing. Mark, uh, you know, we, we've spoken a lot about India and the equities out here. What, what's interesting is the sort of run-up that we've seen in the commodities space. A uh, lot of these hard commodities having seen big multi-year rallies. Any preferred equity plays via this space? Do you like the metal space in India? 
uh, gold, silver? How do you play that? Uh, that's a very, very good point. I believe that uh, every portfolio should have some physical gold. Uh, very, very important. Um, and you can see what's happened to gold and silver. Silver is going to be uh, already is outperforming gold. Um, and I think there are a number of reasons for that. Probably the primary one is that globally, there's a new generation of investors who really don't um, trust the central banks around the world and don't trust the currency. And they want to hedge their portfolios by buying gold and silver. So that's going to be a very interesting development. And of course, as gold moves up, other metals move up as well because they, they're betting on commodities in general to preserve their wealth. So uh, we're seeing a big, big shift. And of course, if you look at the crypto currencies, you'll see they're moving up at a fast pace as well, in line with gold and silver. Okay. Mark, uh, just on that point on commodities, uh, I know you're an India bull, but we also have Brent crude, which is at $90 per barrel. We have tensions simmering between Israel as well as Iran, which could possibly potentially be a risk for crude prices. Do you think that could be a deterrent, at least in the near to medium term? I don't think it'll be deterrent. I think there'll be a gradual increase in the price of oil and in dollar terms. And of course, that's reflecting not so much uh, the oil price, but the depreciation of the dollar. The dollar is, um, of course, very, very plentiful. As you know, the Fed has been printing and printing. Now they're reducing, but still, it's an awful lot of dollars out there. And that's a reflection of the weakness of the dollar, uh, this oil price, and commodities in general, by the way. Just a follow up on the crude bit. Uh, do you look at uh, oil marketing companies as investable options? Uh, Yes, we do, but we're more interested in now in uh, oil companies that are exploring and are having the technology to discover new oil. So uh, that's one area which we think is quite interesting. Uh, any other commodities, uh, industrial metals, which stand out? I mean, copper, for example, is being... Uh, we were supposed to have a big copper super cycle in 2021. We had a bit of a... We had a sharp move, but then uh, that uh, fizzled. Do you think, uh, you know, copper perhaps makes a big comeback? Uh, just your view on other industrial metals. Well, I think nickel is worth looking at. Uh, nickel would be one area, uh, mainly because of the battery. You know, okay. Uh, electric car, battery consumption is increasing, uh, the, the, the need for batteries. So nickel might be interesting. But you've got to be very careful with these commodities because... At the end of the day, uh, the supply-demand equation could be really a problem. But we have to look at that. You know, Mark, you uh, briefly uh, mentioned about interest rates in the West, right? Uh, do you think, uh, you know, so U.S. rates have gone to 5%, 5, five, five and a quarter. Markets in the West have done very well. So the, one can say, well, if, they did, if rates going up did not hurt, if rates coming down, will they help? Uh, but on the other side, for emerging markets, if rates come down and the dollar weakens substantially, I mean, that is a time-tested kind of correlation, right? It means more flows into emerging markets. Uh, sitting here yeah. in India, is that the bet to make? Uh, you know, whenever rates starts to come off and the dollar uh, goes south, I mean, that basically uh, pushes a lot of money towards EMs? Yeah, generally speaking, that's the case. If you see rates come down, uh, it'll be more attractive to go into emerging markets. But the shift... Two emerging markets have already begun. Uh, you must remember that if you look at the U.S. market and the Indian market as a good example, but other markets, uh, Korea has done well, uh, Taiwan has done very well. So uh, people are beginning to diversify away from the U.S. market, knowing that the U.S. market has performed very well, but may not continue uh, the, the uh, trend. So I believe that you're going to see a lot of people diversifying into emerging markets, regardless of what the interest rate is. Now, of course, a lower interest rate means that people are going to be put, putting more money into equities. Okay. Uh, Mark, uh, you know, we're starting uh, earning season soon with TCS. Uh, what is your sense in terms of the IT space, considering uh, the global demand situation, any IT stocks specifically that you like, considering there is a lot happening with regards to artificial intelligence as well? 
Yeah, that very good question, because artificial intelligence is really changing the scenario or software in general. And those companies in the software space that are not taking advantage of AI uh, will be in trouble. But I believe that uh, they have grasped the opportunity and there'll be actually more opportunities for the software, Indian software companies to export their software. So I'm quite bullish on software in general. And I believe that uh, companies uh, that are in this space will do quite well. <laughs> you, you mentioned in passing about uh, the world moving to electric vehicles. I wanted to know whether you've bought an EV yourself or not. <laughs> No, I, I don't I don't drive. <laughs> All right. I, uh, maybe actually, he flies in the private jet. Uh, but, but you know, you know, it's interesting that here in Dubai, uh, if you select an electric vehicle, uh, to, you know, to hire, it's more expensive than the uh, regular petrol engines. So yeah, understandable, it's, given its uh, uh, proximity to oil. But, you know, speaking about that theme itself, a lot of people call Tata Motors as the Tesla of India with money coming out of the U.S. going into India. <laughs> Do you, uh, you know, where are you on that? <laughs> well, I believe that, uh, of course, the, uh, the industry in India will grow at a fast pace with more and more people able to, to afford uh, AI and, uh, in, in, you know, companies that are in the space of uh, applying AI to automobiles, and that's going to be a very good development. But electric vehicles are the future for India as well. Mm. And speaking about the Tatas itself, I mean, a lot of these conglomerates have come back as well. We've seen, you know, big announcements come by from the Birlas trying to set their house in order for a lot of their uh, companies. The Tatas, of course, have been big wealth creators. Uh, your thoughts on some of these conglomerates? Is there anyone that you like? Well, Tata is probably the prime example of a company that's done so well in so many areas and really improved the quality of uh, various sectors. If you look at what they've done in the airline sector and in so many other areas, and uh, they're really a leader in many, in many of these sectors. So I would mm -hmm. say that at the end of the day, Tata will do very well simply because the demand in India is going to increase uh, tremendously and there's going to be a demand for electric vehicles. Right. Uh, Mark, uh, you know, uh, pre-COVID, uh, the, for the, uh, the 10 years or so before that, it was all about services, right? It was about technology. Uh, it was about uh, uh, the, uh, the not, not tangibles, not hard infrastructure. That's changed over the last uh, couple of years after COVID. I mean, I think the world's woken up to the fact that uh, manufacturing capacities in many areas actually is is uh, is, not, is not enough. So there is a revival to, towards that. I just wanted to understand from you uh, the big picture over the next couple of years. What are the big themes within manufacturing? Is it, you know, electrification? What within electrification? Uh, you know, uh, is it is it cars as a theme to play? Is it power? Is uh, you know, just just your overall sense on what are the big manufacturing themes which will do very well? Because at the end of the day, I mean, it's it's all uh, in in a way global. What happens globally comes here sooner than later. Well, uh, the key to the entire system now is technology. Uh, when we go to a manufacturing company, in fact, any company that we're looking at, and we talk to the management, the first thing we ask is, what are you doing in technology? How are you using technology to improve your profitability, improve your efficiency? And that is the key theme. And in manufacturing, it's going to be even more important because with robotics, with AI, uh, the efficiency is going to be improving dramatically. And that's uh, something that we have to look at and be aware of. You cannot be investing in a company that's not using technology to improve its profitability and its efficiency. So uh, uh, the uh, prices, by the way, as a result of AI, will be coming down in real terms. Uh, and therefore, the competition will become much more fierce. Okay. Mark, before we wrap up this conversation, you've previously given a target that the Sensex is probably going to hit that one lakh uh, mark probably in the next five years. Leave us with any kind of targets for the Nifty and the <laughs> Sensex, maybe near term, maybe long term, maybe three years, five years. Well, I stick with that target. I think that's going to happen maybe even sooner than I expected. No question. <laughs> All right. One lakh. <laughs> 
uh, over the next couple of years on the uh, Sensex. Well, Mark, it's a pleasure having you with us here. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and good luck with your fund. And uh, we hope to speak with you, uh, uh, you know, around uh, through, uh, through the next couple of months and, of course, post-elections as well. Thank you indeed for joining us here. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, insightful conversation that the Sensex won lakh in the next couple of years and uh, less than five years. Less than five years. <laughs> and... Also, every portfolio should have some form of physical gold. That was an important saying advice coming in from Mark as well. He spoke about a lot of the equities, etc. as well. But uh, to, you know, hedge your portfolio by having some amount of gold as well wouldn't uh, be too bad. Uh, with that, we've uh, run out of time on this edition of Halftime Report and the special conversation that we had. And take a short break, come back. On the other side, we'll have business lunch, take all the market action forward for you.